Good evening and welcome to our service of Coral Evansong from University College in Durham, here in Tunstall Chapel. It is a privilege and honor to be able to share these services uh, and we hope that you enjoy them. And tonight it's especially a joy and a privilege to welcome as our guest preacher, the Reverend Canon Rosalind Brown, formerly at the Cathedral. You can follow the words of the service on the Daily Prayer app or on the website of the Church of England or in your Book of Common Prayer. We use the traditional form of evening prayer. Uh, and you can also download the order of service for the chapel, which our wonderful video editor uh, Enoch has uploaded. And you find it in the description section under the video. Again, a very warm welcome. The psalm appointed for tonight is Psalm 23. Psalm The first lesson is taken from Genesis chapter 45, verses 1 to 15. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him, and he cried, Cause every man to go out from me. And they stood no man with him, while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were troubled with his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither. For God did send me before you to preserve life. 
For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in which there shall be neither earning nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you prosperity in the earth, and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not that you sent me hither, but God, and he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Haste ye, and go up to my father, and say unto him, Thus saith thy son Joseph, God hath made me lord of all Egypt, and come down unto me, tarry not. And thou shalt dwell in the land of Goshen, and thou shalt be near unto me thou, and thy children, and thy children's children, and thy flocks, and thy herds, and all that thou hast. And there will I nourish thee, for yet there are five years of famine, lest thou and thy family, and thy household, and all that thou hast, come into poverty. And behold, your eyes see, and the eyes of your brother Benjamin, that uh, of my brother Benjamin, that is my mouth that speaketh unto you. And ye shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt, and of all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And he fell unto his brother Benjamin's neck, and wept. And Benjamin wept upon his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brethren, and wept unto them, and after that his brethren talked with him. Here endeth the first lesson. The second lesson is taken from the Epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him that appointed him, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honour than the house. For every house is builded by some man, 
but he that built all things is God. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope, firm unto the end. Here endeth the second lesson.
anthem this evening is Adoramus Te, Christe, by Giovanni Pierluigi da Palestrina. The words Adoramus Te, Christe, et benedictionus tibi, cuiata sanctam cruce, tuam redemisti mundum, can be translated as, We adore thee, O Christ, and we bless thee, because by thy holy cross thou hast redeemed the world. I preached in the cathedral on the story of Jacob, pointing out that he didn't know how to tell the truth if he tried, and afterwards someone thanked me, saying that she thought that she had to like Jacob because he was in the Bible, but it was very hard. No wonder, he was a deceiver left, right and centre, and it was obviously a family trait because his uncle, Laban, deceived and tricked him into marrying the wrong woman, the eldest rather than the youngest of Laban's two daughters, although he did eventually let Jacob marry the younger one, Rachel. And their numerous children continued in the family tradition of deceiving people, taking it to new depths. Now, why do I tell you this? Because today's reading from Genesis is the denouement of a long saga involving all of Jacob's sons, and it has been marked throughout by flagrant deception, especially about identity. For those who don't know the story, here's a quick summary. Jacob's younger son, Joseph, born to Rachel, was his pet, and his 11 older brothers hated him for it. It has to be said that Joseph didn't help being an obnoxious little brother, who told tales on them. Hence the story of Jacob's coat of many colours immortalised in the musical, although more prosaically it was probably a coat with sleeves, not of many colours. And the story of how the brothers sold Joseph to travelling traders, then dipped his coat in blood and told their father that they'd found it, saying Joseph must have been killed by a wild animal. Joseph, meanwhile, was sold into slavery in Egypt, where by hard work he prospered until his master's wife tried to seduce him. And when he refused her advances, falsely accused him of trying to attack her and had him thrown into prison. After several wretched years there, his ability to interpret dreams led to release and promotion in Pharaoh's household, where he managed food supplies during seven years of prosperity, 
building up large reserves which he sold during seven subsequent famine years. Meanwhile, back at jo Jacob's home, 500 miles away, food was getting short. So Jacob sent his sons to Egypt to buy supplies. But Jacob refused to send Rachel's other child, Benjamin, with them. It seems he didn't trust his other sons with, their, with Rachel's children. In Egypt, they failed to recognize Joseph, who appeared Egyptian, but he recognized them. And then he started on the family game of deception to test whether his half-brothers felt any remorse for what they had done all those years ago, and if they would be more careful with the welfare of Benjamin, his only full brother. So he accused them of being spies, and after a dose of prison life focused their minds, Joseph tricked them into a position where they had no option but to bring Benjamin back with them on their next trip, and he held one brother hostage for him. And then when Benjamin did come, Joseph tricked them again by making it appear that Benjamin had stolen his silver cup. As punishment, Joseph decreed that Benjamin should remain in Egypt as his slave, but the rest of them could go. Distraught, the brothers said that Jacob would die of grief if they went back without Benjamin. And that's where we pick the story up. And at that point, Joseph's resolve cracked. Throwing everyone else out, including the interpreter he used to keep up his Egyptian appearance, and amidst floods of tears, he revealed his identity. And the brothers were appalled. The brilliant storyteller who has been building up the tension for chapters says that they could not answer him, so dismayed were they at his presence. And no doubt, remembering what they had done to him, fear of J Joseph's revenge was uppermost in their minds. The tables had turned, he had all the power, and they were at his mercy. But as we heard, Joseph had other ideas, and putting the past behind him, instructed them to hurry back home to collect Jacob for a long-awaited reunion. And incidentally, it seems that Jacob had never quite believed the story that his son spun about Joseph's death. This arch liar knew a tall story when he heard it. But Joseph's brothers were stunned into silence, and only after lots more tears, hugs and kisses initiated by Joseph did they dare to talk to him. If we move the story forward to tomorrow evening's reading, we read that on hearing this news, Jacob was similarly stunned and didn't believe his sons. But once convinced, his response was, enough, my son Joseph is still alive, I must go and see him before I die. And the storyteller inserts fascinating little details. The family's transport was a wagon, while Joseph, befitting his new status, used a chariot. And when they did meet, Jacob said, I can die now having seen for myself that you are still alive. And that thought links us to another familiar text which the choir sang earlier on and is said or sung at every service of Evensong. It's the song of another old man, Simeon, at the end of another long life. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared before the face of every people. Simeon, it has to be said, was nothing like the liar Jacob, who had made his way through life by wheeler dealing. Instead, Simeon was righteous and devout, looking forward to God's comfort and the deliverance of people from his people from oppression. And the Holy Spirit rested on him. That's another unusual detail, because until Pentecost, the Holy Spirit did not rest on people permanently, so much as empower them for a particular moment and then depart. But the Spirit of God rested on this old man and now guided him to come to the temple, where he suddenly realised that an ordinary looking baby was the Lord's promised Messiah. So we have two old men at the end of very different lives, 
but both now able to face death with tranquility. By the law of averages, students do not have to face death very often, although this college faced the sudden deaths of Olivia Burt in 2018 and Professor David Held a year ago. But we have all faced a lot of death in the past year. And I expect that many of you know someone who has died of COVID, despite the brilliant care that the hospitals have provided. And even if we don't know anyone personally, we cannot help but be aware of how precarious life is at times like this. So Jacob and Simeon challenge us about whether we are ready to die peacefully, or if there are unresolved things in life that need to be sorted out before it's too late. It was God's mercy that enabled Joseph to help his brothers lay things to rest. But we know that they never quite trusted him, since after Jacob's death, they feared he might still bear a grudge. So we're told they approached him with a story, true or not, about Jacob instructing them to say to Joseph that he should forgive them their crime of harming him. And then, finally, they asked for forgiveness, offering to be his slaves. But again, Joseph wept, reassuring them that although they meant harm, God had turned it to good, as he had been able to save numerous people from starvation. Now all of them, like Simeon, could die in peace. We don't like to talk about death, but in these COVID times, maybe Joseph, his brothers and Simeon challenge us. Is there anything we need to do to ensure that if we are knocked down by a car tomorrow, we can die in peace, knowing that we are not leaving ends untied or harsh feelings for others? In peace, knowing that we have tasted the goodness and kindness of God. If you need to talk things through, I'm sure that Stephanie is available. Remember, it is our birthright as Christians to know the peace of which Simeon's words remind us, Edensong by Edensong by Edensong, and which this week Joseph's, Joseph's family has illustrated. Amen. Let us pray. On this third Thursday in Lent, we give thanks for the opportunities we have had so far to cultivate our relationship with God, for glimpses of God's peace and glory wherever we may be on the globe at this time. Whenever we have failed to live up to our high expectations about ourselves, we give thanks to God for grace compassion and care, and for second chances. For each occasion of success, we give thanks for those who made it possible and to God. May we build our lives in the knowledge that God's love for us is unconditional, that it does not depend on what we regard as success or failure, but is a well always available for us all and by which we can all rest. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We give thanks for our friends, family, dear ones, colleagues, peers, in whom we find support and care at this time, and those with whom we long to be reunited. We pray that we may be reminded daily of the presence of God in our lives, God who sustains us, and whose peace and grace offer us a true and sure foundation, as well as the source of life-giving transformation. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. In moment of silence, we offer our own prayers of gratitude, we address our own petitions to God, and we listen to God's still small voice. O 
Almighty God, Thou hast given us grace at this time, with one accord, to make our common supplications to Thou, and Thou hast promised that when two or three are gathered together in Thy name, Thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of Thy truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We conclude our prayers in the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all evermore.